Now, I'm very happy to introduce a name lots of you will know, former Celtic player, 300-plus games for Manchester United across 11 seasons. He left in 1984. Scottish international, of course. Uh, managed Stoke in the 90s, still lives there now. Uh, Lou McCarry, great to have you with this evening. Thanks, Joe. How's the form? You're well? It's fine. Everything's fine. Good. Well, listen, we, um, you know I want to talk to you because by any standards you've done an extraordinary thing. You might take us back four years ago, maybe to the genesis of this whole thing. You were uh, uh, sitting down for a cup of tea and reading the local paper. I was, and in the local paper there's a big debate about the number of homeless people in Stoke-on-Trent. Some uh, councillors were saying there was very few single figures. Other councillors were saying there's, there's over 100, so I thought I'll go and see for myself. Took a trip up into to Hanley, uh, parked my car, walked across the road, found 12 homeless people in, in one doorway, and I went and found another six in another doorway. So I quickly uh, had the opinion there was already, there was too many, that was in one road. Went round the corner, I found another half a dozen or so, and um, went home. I was satisfied there was more than the original single figures number that some councillors were talking about and just sat back and thought, is there anything I could do to help those people that are on the streets? And fortunately, Joe, due to my previous career of Celtic and Manchester United and playing for Scotland, I called upon a few friends who had, who had dealt with over the years and in management as well, um, that were on the council and asked them to find me a building. And if they found me a building, I'd open the, the door, I'd bring in the homeless people and I would uh, feed them, clothe them, and put a roof over their head. And that's that simply was it, Joe. I didn't intend to do anything else. Um, I had no idea how what it was like to be homeless. I had no idea what it was like for them to be continually on the streets. I just knew it wasn't pleasant. So I quickly achieved that because I, I did believe I could achieve it. And um, four years later, I'm still there because it's gone, it's gone so well for us in terms of looking after people and in terms especially of the support that I've had from everyone, not just in this area, but uh, we've had recognition from FIFA. Now, I didn't have any recognition during my football career at any time from FIFA, but uh, we've had it as a homeless shelter here. As you know, FIFA's in Switzerland. We're in Stoke-on-Trent. And to have that recognition, that tells me we've done something right. We've done something that that most people like, which is to, to help less fortunate people. Lou, four years ago, when most people are reading that article in the local paper and they're seeing councillors disagree and they'll think to themselves, hmm, that's interesting, I, I wonder what the issue is, I'll keep an eye out. And then they turn the page and see what's in the sports section. What prompted you to get in your car, do you think, that day? Because I knew, I, I knew it wouldn't have been right to turn the page without uh, trying to do something about it. And I thought, Joe, I thought, I've not done a great deal in my life to help other people because everything's been for me. I've, I've had great football clubs. Um, I'd been to Dublin plenty of times as well to, to work for yourselves and other people. And I'd been to the, um, the I think it's Capuchin Day Centre, it was called. Yeah. I think it will still be there. And of course, that was a, a brother Kevin was in charge at the time. I don't know if he's still there. And I used to see people queuing round the street to come in for the lunch. And I used to go in with them and sit there with brother Kevin and thought, bloody hell, I, I've never known this was going on in the world. People begging for food, desperate for food. So it all, it all really started for me in Dublin because I didn't see a lot of homeless people over my football career in, in Stoke and Trent, where I live. But after the football career had, had gone, uh, gone into management and, and doing television especially, I'd been to Dublin, as I say, I'd, I'd, I'd stayed in a nice hotel in, in the main street in Dublin and just round the corner was, I think it was Bow Street, B-O-W Street, Bow Street, where this Capuchin Day Centre was. And I used to see what was happening there. And that was the first indication I had to the less fortunate people, um, not just in Stoke on Trent, but in the world. So given an opportunity, which I knew I could do, and I knew I could feed people, Joe, and I knew I could get clothes for them, uh, and I knew I could put the roof over their head, I simply decided, well, I'm going to do it. And four years ago, I set off to achieve that, 
we did achieve it, and four years later, um, still going. We're still going. Yeah, brother Kevin is still there, by the way. He welcomed the Pope to the centre a couple of years ago as well. He's in his eighties now, right. so still, still going strong. Um, so when you get going and you, and you open this centre, and I know with COVID now, the glamping pods have really caught the imagination and the media has been highlighting the glamping pods. But when you first open the centre and there's no COVID and people can interact and mix, how many people, Lou, were, were using the service? Uh, could, you, could you meet demand? Did you have to turn people away? What, how did all that work in those initial years? Uh, in the initial years, we had a small building. Um, it was too crowded. It was too cramped. Um, there was no uh, flexibility in terms of watching TV or listening to radio. There was, there, there was one channel on because whoever had the remote control was in, in, in complete control of the centre, really. Yeah. So that was a problem. Um, it was a problem on a Saturday especially when football was on and uh, it was on various channels and different teams were on different channels. And we had a mixture of Stoke, Man United, Celtic, hmm. uh, Port Vale... Uh, we had a mixture of those supporters, City, Liverpool. And so there was, there was a, obviously a, there was always a, a bit of a tussle on a match day, Saturday especially, to get a hold of that remote control. When we went into the pods, I, I just decided I'd ring the Football League Managers Association, of which I'm a member, and ask Richard Bevan, who's in charge, could he, could he get me some TVs? Because I knew they had a sponsor, LG. And uh, I wanted 46 televisions for 46 pods. And a week later, um, the 46 televisions arrived. We put them in the pods along with heating. Uh, they had the number on each pod. So for the first time in their life, probably, the people that stayed with us had some sort of identity and they had a number, they had an address. And um, the biggest thing of all, though, was the televisions because the, the first day we actually opened in the new centre, they all had their tellies, and I came in and I thought, everybody's left me, everybody's gone. Uh, you could hear a pin drop. And the big difference was they were now in their own pods, watching their own television, um, probably tuned into at the time, believe it or not, Brexit and things like that, which they would have no interest on in, but it, it was on the telly. Then the virus came along, and the televisions again helped educate them to what the virus was all about because they were saying to me, well, we haven't got the virus. We, we can go out. There's no reason for us to stay in. And I was having a bit of a job, Joe, of convincing them that everyone's got to be locked down and that includes yourself. And um, the televisions have been a bit of a miracle. I wouldn't say an actual miracle, but they've helped enormously to uh, change or help to change the lifestyle of which I'm not in control of that. I don't, I'm not a great believer in I will actually change their lifestyle, but I did believe, uh, Joe, that I could feed them a bit like the day centre in, in Dublin. I could feed them, I could clothe them, and I could look after them and put a roof over their head with the generosity of the people in Stoke and Trent and surrounding areas and people all over, people all, all over, all over the world, I'm getting calls from everywhere. and People want to help. People want to donate things to me. They want to donate money. We had a guy come in at Christmas and wrote me out a cheque for £5,000. Wow. I'd never seen him before. I'll never see him again, probably. Mm. And that's been, that's been the support that we've had. And that's through the help of, certainly through the help of football. You well, know, maybe well, I, 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 Yeah, well, I, I think as well, people are responding to just what's so very clearly uh, goodness on your part. It's just no agenda. Uh, what, what age were you? Four years ago, a 67-year-old man just wanting to do something good and, yeah. and people want to, to help you. It's very interesting what you say about the TVs and maybe uh, I, like, clearly someone on the streets isn't going to have a TV or a way to plug into society maybe and, and how that's almost impacted on their uh, lifestyle in a way. But also that point you make about having a number over the door, you know, and an and, and address if they want to even think about getting a job or their yeah. own private space. Like, you know, I, even in other shelters, who, and they're all doing brilliant work, but I, I don't know, I'm sure I'm, like a lot of people, the thought of your own private space where you can make it tidy and make it hospitable and make it yours must psychologically just mean so much to so, some people. I agree with you, though, uh, Jordan. The job centre, 
that was always a big thing. They used to go to the job centre, um, had no address, obviously they were in the streets. So getting an address for them, which they had in our previous place was good, but having a, their own number to, I think, proudly say to the people in the job centre and universal credits, they've got to register with them. I think to say to them, I say at number five or number 10 or number seven, um, Regent Road in Hanley, Stoke on Trent. I think that's a that's a big deal as well, Joe. And, and I wouldn't have before I got involved with homeless people. I would never have considered that as as any big deal because I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate in football to have played for Celtic and Manchester United. And I don't think there's many people in the world can better that. Mm. I've been fortunate. I was at Celtic for six years. I, I come in and I took the place of some of the Lisbon Lions. So I realised that was an achievement in itself. And then I went to Manchester United and Best Law Charlton and played with those three before they left uh, and played with a Manchester United team that got better. You know, and people keep thinking getting better as a team can happen overnight. I experienced it didn't happen overnight, but when it did happen, uh, Manchester United was a better team. People still talk about the team I played for. So I look back and, and think how fortunate I've been. And now I'm dealing with people that are the very opposite. I realise the huge gap between being fortunate and being not so fortunate. I won't say unfortunate because sometimes homeless people um, don't do, don't react the way they should do and get criticised for it. And I wouldn't say that criticism is wrong because some of them, due, due to the drugs and, and due to the drink, get it wrong, get it wrong in the town centres and do things wrong and, and people have not so good opinions of them. But they've, I just like to think most people would understand that when they've got drugs inside them, when they've had too much alcohol, that's not the real person. And I'm fortunate in here, Joe, I see the real person mm. and I see the wrong person probably in the space of a week. Uh, and it's quite scary. I'm sure it is. And, and on that front, you know, I, it, it's such a scourge in society, drink and drugs. And, you know, I'm sure for people who fall on hard times, it's uh, just a relief. It's an, an escapism and it's, you know, highlight of their day, understandably. And we'd probably all be the same. How do you manage uh, 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 residents, I guess, of, of your centre in the throes of drink and drug addiction if they turn up in a bad state or if, you know, you, you, they, they want to bring something onto the property? They're, they're tricky issues for you to try and know what the right thing to do is. Very tricky issues. We've got a number of people in here at the moment that rely on alcohol. And saying that to me, Joe, someone who started a Celtic with, with the strictest manager I've ever had in football and the best man, probably the best manager, Jock Steen, no drink was allowed. I know Celtic players in, in later years, um, people did talk about them drinking, but when Jock was in charge in the days of the Lisbon Lions, drink was taboo. He'd throw you out of the football club. I remember those days as an apprentice. I've seen people getting thrown out. Uh, it's different in here. I've got to understand which being a non-drinker all my life still don't drink it's a bit difficult for me under, to understand but i've got to understand that because um it's part of being somebody on the streets who's an alcoholic it's, it's part of that that doesn't go away overnight it won't go away overnight i would love it to go away i'd love to change it i'd love to be able to get the better of the drugs and i'd love to know the formula to get the better of all the drugs that are about at this moment in time. Mm. But I would, I realise I'd be wasting my time concentrating on that, right. the drinking the drugs. I'm concentrating on Joe, making sure there'll be plenty of food. We give them plenty of food, four meals a day they get, breakfast, lunch, evening meal, and a supper. Uh, nobody goes out, away, out from us uh, slimmer than they come in here. <laughs> I realise that's... Uh, that's a good thing. No one's ever going to go hungry. And but the biggest challenge of all yeah. would be to beat the drugs and yeah, the drink. Look, I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know how you do that. There's no easy solution. And so, Lou, would there people staying with you for weeks, months on end, who effectively live there and they can hang around all day? They don't have to head out if they don't want to, kind of thing. Yeah. That's it. Months, weeks, years. Got people with us. Have been with us since the very start. Wow. Four years ago. Wow. They're still here. 
Uh, I don't think they're still here because I failed. I didn't set out to cure them of their addictions because better people than me have tried it and and they failed. And what they are, they are. Uh, all I can do is give them a bit of advice. Um, I've taken some to Old Trafford. Now, I don't know who you support, Joe, but some people will say that's a punishment. Other people will say it's a good thing. I didn't believe in it was something they may never, ever achieve in their lifetime. You must, you must then have taken people to their first ever experience of Old Trafford. That, that must be an amazing gift to give to somebody. Well, that's why I did it, Joe. I realised that because I know what it's like um, having played for United and still working there, I know what it's like for people to come on the trips, the day trips from Dublin and all of the other parts of the Republic of Ireland. It's a big deal to them, and they've been time and time again. But when they get to Old Trafford, you can tell that it's, a, it's another great day for them. So I realised if someone gets there for the first time, it's going to be an unbelievable day for them, no matter no matter who they support, no matter who they support. And just before Christmas, a week before Christmas, we had a chef down from, from Manchester United, along with some other staff members at the club, who put on, a week before Christmas, put on Christmas lunch for them. The chef was there cooking, and this is the chef that cooks for Manchester United and, and all, the, um, all the people that support the club financially in terms of sponsors. So it was a, a big day for us, and... It was great. It yeah. was again. It was another little achievement for us. And 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 so like, Lou, I think we've all been out on nights in the winter where it's just bitterly cold, and you're running to your car, and it has crossed my mind because we have a terrible problem in Dublin with homelessness. Like it's a it's a disgrace. You know, it's it's to to you know shame on all of us really. And I I it crosses my mind when you see them because you know plenty around where we work or whatever. How do they get through the night? Like, I, I couldn't imagine being out for an hour, let alone, you know, 12 hours and then into the following day. What do the people in your centre tell you about life on the streets? How do they survive it? I, like, I just, I, I can't even imagine. I wouldn't be able for it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it, Joe, because I did it for one night at Stoke Football Club because Stoke thankfully put on a one night in a year for us to invite people to sleep rough, to see what it's like. And um, and the proceeds of that go to our centre. So Stoke have been brilliant with that. But um, I intended to go every year, but I, I did it for the first time. Um, it took me about five days to recover. And even then I didn't recover. And I promised myself I'd never do it again. So it made me more aware of how homeless people, how they managed to do it, I don't know. Because they do it for days, months, and then years. So there's a certain toughness about them, which I have, ex I have experienced in here. And um, I do say to them from time to time, don't step out of line. I don't want to show you the door. But I don't think that's a massive problem for them when they've done it before. I know they still prefer to be in a pod with the radiator and the heat in there and the television and everything else that goes with it. But um, I don't think it scares them that much the, the way it would scare yourself, myself, and the rest of the, the public that we know of. I don't think it scares them as much as that. They, 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 they've been battle-hardened to that sort of lifestyle. Uh, I know they'd prefer the lifestyle they've got at this moment in time. And so I suppose when you're chatting to them, you, you might eventually get a feel as to how they ended up on the streets or how they ended up homeless. Is there a common theme across the many that you've met over the years? Is there, is, you know, be it uh, coming from tough homes or maybe it's addiction or just bad luck? Is there, is there a theme which tends to crop up more often than not? I think th th there's everything, Joe. Everything that you just mentioned there, I could repeat. Um, so there's no certain way of doing it. But what I, what I do realise already, and I don't like the thought of it, that uh, fortunately, if we quickly get rid of the virus we've got, our next biggest job is to get rid of these drugs. Mm. It's terrible. Yeah, really. It is. And it's, and it's going to be a massive job because in the four years I've been doing it, I've seen a gradual increase. I don't want to see an increase. I've seen the reaction from people when they're on them. I've seen people that I know that are good people up on rooftops, throwing slates off of rooftops, doing all this other silly things, um, doing lots of silly things and, and 
doing things they wouldn't do if they didn't have drugs in them, especially the drugs when they do these crazy things. Yeah. Um, have there been great stories to come out of this over the four years? Have people got back in their feet? Have they managed to get jobs? Have they managed to, to move on? Has, have, have there been moments like that where this has been incredibly fulfilling for you? Yeah, because that that gives me as you know, probably no, I'm doing this. It gives me as much satisfaction as a as a win on a Saturday when I played at Celtic and Man United, um, um, because it's just as difficult. No, it's even more difficult to get that that you've just mentioned um, over a period of time because mm. it doesn't happen that often. And sometimes, and I have been surprised, it's happened with the the least likely people. That have stayed with me. Right. If you'd have said to me, like a certain couple that did get married, if you'd have said to me that when they were in here, um, it would happen for those two, I'd have said no. They they're too much into the drugs. They they're too much into shoplifting. They're too much into stealing. It's not going to happen for them. And it has happened. And I thought, well, it'll only be for so long. But I think the fact that a child came along quickly was a big help and that couple are still together and I can't believe it sometimes that knowing all I did know about the couple, that all that I've just told you that's happened, mm. has happened. And are they away from the centre now? They're away from the centre, oh they went from the centre a year ago, I didn't think it would last and I said the child came along, so they have lasted, the child has, has lasted. And, and really, I take the view, I might be wrong, Joe, but I take the view that the child has been a bit like the televisions in the pods, that that's been a big, big difference to us here. I think the child in this relationship has probably been the, the deciding factor that they would cut down on the, on the drugs and admit, try and make someone's life, which is this child, uh, a lot better for them. Are you at the uh, centre now? I am, yes. Is this your, are you, like, are you there every day? Is this your full-time job almost? Um, if the lockdown hadn't have come, then I'd be at Old Trafford. I'd, I'd be there doing the hospitality. I'd be there doing the television most weeks, which was a great release from me, from, from the centre. And the sooner we get back to normal, normal routine, I'll be back to Old Trafford two days a week probably. Yeah. But at this moment in time, um... It's a crazy thing to say, but I spend my spare time here and it keeps me reasonably sane. Because if I was locked up at home all the time, uh, I'd probably be going cracker show. It's an extraordinary thing you've done, though. Like, at 71, you should have the feet up, you should be scared stiff of this virus, you should be, you know, taking it easy. And here you are at half nine at night and you're at the centre. Um, what effect do you think all of this has had on you as a person? If I'd failed, I'd be in distress. But when we, this week, we've had um, all the, the big newspapers in, in, in England, they've all been down here. As I say, in the past, probably three months ago, we, we had FIFA. Uh, I've had a continual stream of TV companies. I've got them coming tomorrow, ITV and one or two others. Um, so that tells me, nothing else tells me, it's, it's been a good thing for me to do. Mm because that recognition of all the people I've just mentioned, um, it's, a, it's a great recognition for people to, to be even following you. Um, so it, I'm, I'm happy I did it. Yeah, I'll never sure. regret it. I could have regretted it if it hadn't have gone so well for us, but um, I tried to be, I tried to decide to be fair with the people we had, um, a little bit lenient uh, in the early days, I was getting accused by staff of being lenient, yeah. too lenient. Too soft. <laughs> too soft. I was never too soft. <laughs> no, I wasn't, Joe, because I've got no fear of anybody in here. Uh, when I've got to stand up to them, I will stand up to them. Yeah. And um, I'd like to think that sort of um, uh, reflects my football days, where I had no fear of anybody. Um, I, could, I would stand up to anybody. And that started with my days at Celtic, with a manager who instilled that in me, who advised me what to do, what not to do, who helped me get off on the right footing in football. And um, I will always be, I'll certainly always be grateful to Jock Steen, not just Jock Steen, Jock Steen, Sean Fallon, 
Uh, man from yeah, the man, man, yeah. who was my reserve team manager. These two guys taught me great habits. And then I was fortunate, moving on in football, to have other people who taught me great habits as well. And Tommy Doherty, and Dave Sexton, and Ron Atkinson at Old Trafford. Three different types of guys, three different types of managers, mm. but all people that, um, that I learned a lot from. I must, well, uh, an, another night we must chat to you about your football career. But um, listen, it's 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 just amazing. I, I like you're in the zero point zero zero one percent of people who would be flicking through the paper and see a story like that and say, "I'm going to hop in my car and see what it's like," and then do something about it. And four years later, you're at the centre as a seventy-one year old still doing this. I don't mean to be ageist at all, by the way, but just oh, you keep repeating that. Joe. I know. I'm you sorry. Say, well, it's yeah. just I, I, it's it's a time in your life where you you you'd put your feet up, and because you said you seventy-one year old. <laughs> after younger people. Well, I know, listen, and you'll be doing it for another 30, 40 years, I'm sure. But I think you said an interesting thing, which was that you, you felt maybe I haven't done much in my life for other people. And I think a lot of people feel like that. I think we would all like to do more and then life gets in the way, doesn't it? And you, you, you did it. And it, that, that's what really jumps out to me, you know? Yeah, I did it because I thought I could do it. I knew I could do it. And... I'd have felt ashamed of myself if I hadn't have attempted to do what I honestly and genuinely thought I could do. Supply the food or help with the help of other people to supply the food, get clothes, which we did do, and get them a roof over the head, which we did do, and get, we've got 24 paid staff, we've got no volunteers. Uh, I thought we could get 24 paid staff uh, to look after them. Um, and everybody's got different views and we have lots of arguments in here about the people we look after. But at the end of the day, um, I'm the boss. They've got to do what I tell them. And anybody they think shouldn't be in here, I will fight their corner and say, no, I'm sorry. I think they're good enough to stay with us. Um, whether they make progress right away or not, doesn't matter to me. Over a period of time, I'm, I'm hoping for a bit of progress. But um, they're off the streets. And having experienced myself for one night and only one night and it will only ever be one night mm. i would never want to do that uh, i'd never want to do it again and i realize that um, with all the problems they may have and with all the shortcomings they may have that um, they're entitled to an opportunity they get that opportunity and i hope it i've mentioned one the thing in particular that did happen for us has been other things. I'm just hoping moving ahead now, Joe, I can talk about in the coming years, I can talk about other things that um, we can all be proud of. Yeah, well, listen, uh, great to have you on. I, well done. It's brilliant. Like all of us um, uh, doff our caps to you. It's just uh, an amazing thing that you're doing for loads of people. So Lou McCary, uh, pleasure. Wish you well with all the centre uh, in its future. Hope it goes well. Keep up the great work and we'll, we'll talk to you again sometime, I'm sure. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. All right. Lou McCarry there.